Clive Priddle. This is The Current, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by uh, two distinguished professors. Mariana Mazzucato is Professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at University College London, where she's the founding director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. She is the author of The Entrepreneurial State and Fresh in Paperback, The Value of Everything. And also with us is Rebecca Henderson, who's the John and Natty MacArthur University Professor at Harvard and the author of the just published Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. Thank you both for joining The Current today. Thank uh, you. You are both uh, economic experts, business experts, and uh, authors whose work has expressed concern and some criticism of the way that capitalism was functioning uh, even going into 2020, uh, prior to our uh, COVID moment. So I wanted to start today by asking, what do you think COVID has done to the economy? And perhaps um, we could split that question between you and ask um, in a second, Mariana Mazzucato to take the idea of what's happened to the national economy, the state economy because of COVID. And Rebecca Henderson, maybe you could start and tell us what, um, what does corporate life look like, corporate economies look like in the world of COVID? Sure, so um, I mean, COVID has really woken us up to all sorts of issues, underlying issues that were obviously there before COVID. We shouldn't forget that just two months ago, we weren't clapping health workers, but firefighters uh, in Australia and California. So the climate crisis is still out there. And really the question I think is, have we built systems? Have we built states? Have we built uh, corporations, how we built relationships between them that are helping us solve some of the biggest challenges we have today, both around climate health, but also, you know, issues around, for example, the digital divide, which is a huge issue in COVID with all these kids, I've got four of them at home, and obviously they're not all accessing education online equally, depending on all sorts of issues, especially uh, social class. And so, I mean, one of the big, big lessons is we're only as healthy as our neighbors are. And if we have weak health systems, and let's use the old word also welfare states, so, you know, structures within um, governments that are there really to protect people, but also to give them what Sen would call capabilities and opportunities. If those are weak, we are all unhealthy when you have a pandemic. Rebecca, um... Talk to us about how corporate America, or indeed corporations around the world, are responding to COVID. Can, are they in any fit state to be good partners with governments in a, in a uh, socially responsible uh, reaction to this, or are they just struggling to survive right now? The large corporations are not struggling to survive. If anything, they're gaining more power in this uh, in this difficult moment. Uh, some, of course, are working flat out, um, and in some sectors, hospitality and tourism, revenue has collapsed, but the core of the economy is still turning over. And I think we're seeing COVID have two major effects. One is um, a visceral awareness that they should have planned for risk. So many corporations run their supply chains and their operations for low cost, for efficiency, running lean and mean. And what the pandemic has really highlighted is the importance of focusing on risk. This was an idea that was in the air with climate change uh, getting more and more serious. But I think now many uh, senior executives are really taking that on board. And I think there will be a radical rethinking of the construction of things like supply chains and, uh, and investing in insurance for these low probability but highly uh, destructive events. Of course, climate change is not a low probability event, so lots of focus on risk. The other change to your question, Clive, is I think a renewed appreciation for the power of the state and for just how important the creation of public value is um, on the part of government. You, you cannot live through this pandemic and think that you really don't need government or that a functioning healthcare system is not important. And so I think many business leaders are willing to step up to the plate and engage with government in a new way. In this country, of course, the administration um, has not so far shown any appetite for really doing that at scale. But I think as we move forward, that's going to be increasingly central to the agenda. 
This arbitrary and unconstitutional overreach has destroyed my career. How did they come up with this number of six feet? I think they just pulled it out of their rear ends. My biggest fear right now is how quick American patriots crumbled and hid in their homes because their government told them that they should. This is a Chi-Com globalist bioweapon meant to shut down our economy. I think what's going on is reflective of a much deeper political issue around identity and polarization. So in fact, what's driving those protests is not some kind of I mean, yes, at some level, they don't understand the science, but it's worse than that. They have completely closed their eyes to the science and the ears. They're living in a completely kind of, there's a wonderful op-ed in the New York Times about this today, about a hall of mirrors where any attack on the president is taken as you know, evidence that he's right. I mean, it, living in the States is freaky right now. It's, it's really two completely different universes. So yes, either of us could say, well, you know, we have to keep shut because if we open, there'll be a recurrence of the disease. It'll be bad for the economy in the long term. But I sort of think that's missing the point. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely agree with you, Rebecca, but I do think that it's, you know, another wake up call is how we have communicated science. I have a right to buy food what without being forced to participate in a fake Global false flag pandemic. There's no pandemic. So definitely when you have sure. an anti yeah, an anti-science president, you know, that that really is a huge battle for anyone. But even when we have should we call them good presidents? <laughs> the Obamas. No, anyway, even when we have more functional presidents, it's still, you know, you still have you talked about before the working class. Let's talk about it also in terms of people who've been really marginalized uh, in the system who we talked before about the digital divide, even how students are being educated, what we need to really have that co-creation agenda that we've both been talking to is also think about how we communicate and who we bring to the table in the first place to even talk about what needs to be done. And you know, if I look at the climate challenge where we talk about the just transition, which is all about how to make sure that workers are protected, who are moving from kind of brown industries to green industries, that concept is very important because it means we need to be investing in people for the transition. But another way to look at it is have the trade unions even been at the table in the first place to define, to imagine, to dream, what does a green city, what does a sustainable agenda look like? Or is it really just being driven by people like yourself and me and some government officials and some, you know, at best, some great businesses? We really need, I think, to wake up with both the climate challenge and what we're seeing in the streets with the health pandemic ch challenge that we need to bring more voices to the table and how we even define what the problems are. Within that, of course, I we need to listen. And as academics, we'll always agree with that. I think it's even worse than you suggest. It's not that we haven't brought trade unions to the table. There are almost no trade unions. Yeah, exactly. The, you know, <laughs> yeah, but that's part of why they're not at the table. We've destroyed them. But, but it's even worse than that. Mm. We have a massive racial divide in this country. I think race is driving politics in a very deep way. Yeah. And this phrase, you know, nothing about us without us, that doesn't mean just the trade unions. That means, you know, minorities, um, yeah. particularly African-Americans, black and brown people, you know, we, and, and we're living in a world where that conversation is so charged and so difficult. So that, yeah. in fact, I think inclusion and radical inclusion is fundamental to building this kind of yes. co-creation value. And how to do that in a way that doesn't leave 25% of the American population embittered and angry and fully armed? How yeah. to make this conversation genuinely inclusive in all ways? Yeah. That, that seems but that's why central. I think, yeah. I agree. And I think just coming back to the earlier point, these issues around inclusion and sustainability and radical inclusion, I like that phrase, need to be even not only nested within the contracts and the relationships that we're setting up for the kind of immediate emergency in terms of how yeah. different uh, uh, structures are now being set up. If we don't do that, it'll be a massive opportunity or a crisis wasted <laughs> Um, and I'm very hopeful as well as you are. I mean, you know, markets are fundamentally outcomes of how we govern both the state, but also civil society organizations and the private sector. And your point before about, you know, the free market versus free politics, 
you know, we shouldn't forget that Adam Smith said that the free market was basically free from rent. It was not free from the state. So rediscovering now what the state actually can do and how to increase its capacity, its capacity also for dialogue and empathy, not only for kind of the big infrastructure projects, is a huge, huge uh, challenge and opportunity. Listen, it was a really terrific conversation. Thank you both. Um, I think people will really get a lot out of this. Uh, I hope, of course, they'll come to your books um, because there's so much more to be found in them too. But um, short term, thank you for sharing your time with us and um, stay well and we really appreciate it. Great. And Rebecca, so Thanks, wonderful to talk to you. I'm a big fan of your work. So. Oh, Mariana, you're so kind. I love the entrepreneurial state. I mean, yes, 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 yes. I just got a copy of your new book about value, and I'm going to read the whole thing. I think we have so much on the the same wavelength. When I'm next in England, which I hope is not too long, can we get together, please? I would love that. I would love that. Let's go to dinner or come to my house. um, And when I come to Boston, I'll call you up or New Hampshire. That would be totally brilliant. Thanks so much. Okay. Clive, thank thank you. you. Charles, thanks a lot. Pleasure. Thank you both. Take care. Hachette.